Stories of Futures Past presents five stories featuring robots. The Obedient Servant by S. M. Tennyshaw. The Builders by Fox B. Holden. A Bad Day for Sales by Fritz Leiber. All Jackson's Children, by Daniel F. Galuye. Beside Still Waters, by Robert Sheckley. The Obedient Servant, by S. M. Tenshaw. Originally published in Imagination Stories of Science and Fantasy, June 1956. Narrated by Tom Trussell. They quarrelled at breakfast. This was not strange, because they quarrelled often. But it bothered him after he had called for his car and was on the way to his office. He realised she was the only one left. The realisation came suddenly, and now he was frightened. This strange man who needed friends as a spider needs flies, in order to survive. His wealth had drawn them, of course a fact he refused to believe, but even unlimited resources could not hold them, and insult and abuse drove them all finally away. Yet he continued to insult and abuse, while painfully seeing them leave, because that was the kind of man he was. Until now they were all gone, the dear ones, the relatives, even the fawners, and he realised in panic that only Dolores was left. But she will stay. There is no cause to worry. She will stay because she loves me, because she married me. But he was nervous. He knew this quarrel had to be patched up because he had too much at stake. And knowing only one way to patch a quarrel, he frowned and pondered. A gift, of course, but what? She had everything. Another diamond necklace, another ruby ring. Somehow he felt neither would do the trick this time. The quarrel had been very bitter. Then he remembered and smiled and told his chauffeur, There is a store I noticed in the International Building, Commission Company. Stop off there. He marched into the richly decorated show room and said, I am John Gardner of Gardner Industries. I understand you've got something new. The clerk almost snapped his spine, bowing. John Gardner, Mr. Billions himself. If he could get him on the customer list, it would be a tremendous prestige boost. Indeed we have, sir. I imagine you are referring to a new unit, Domestic Two. I don't know what you call it, but it's the servant robots you people have spent millions publicising. Will it actually do what you claim? Oh, yes, our advertising was underplayed, if anything. You see, Mr. Gardner, robots have been found quite satisfactory for assembling work, manufacturing operations and the like, where they functioned as mere automatons. I know, Gardner said coldly. I use seven hundred of them in small parts assembly. But only now has Kamis been able to individualise the robot and endow it with real intelligence. The process involved a new sensitizer we developed. This device is motivated by a microwave control individualised to the unit itself. The result, Mr. Gardner, is basic intelligence and unswerving devotion. Each unit is... You talk too much, Gardner growled with his usual tact. Trot one of the things out and let me look it over. Certainly, sir, and the clerk scurried away, fearful of offending this powerful man. A few moments later, the drapes parted, and a robot walked into the room. Gardner scowled at it. He was disappointed. Rather tall, isn't it? The clerk, following close behind the robot, said, True, 
but its dimensions are the result of exhaustive scientific research. The height is nine feet three and one quarter inches. The arm span six feet two inches. The body and the appendages are well padded with a new vinolive plasticine, almost a flesh equivalent. The hands, you will note, sir, are absolute masterpieces of human ingenuity. The unit can powder a rock or pick up a pin. Let me demonstrate. It's about time, Gardiner growled. The demonstration was spectacular. The robot took a one-inch steel bar in its hands and formed a loop. It threaded an old-fashioned sewing needle, then picked up a fragile vase and moved it tenderly across the room. The clerk beamed with justifiable pride. "'Tell the gentleman your qualifications, Raymond.' The robot looked at Gardner through two blue electronic eyes and said, "'I can perform any task a human servant can perform, and I will be more devoted and loyal than a human servant could possibly be. Your commands will be obeyed without question. Your wishes will always be fulfilled to the limit of my power. You and you alone will be my god.' The salesman coughed apologetically. A little flowery, I'm afraid, but her advertising and sales engineers demanded it. Where does the voice come from? Another commiss into innovation. An ultrasonic selector draws the words from a storage wire attuned to... Enough chatter, I'll take one. The salesman beamed. Where would you like it delivered, sir? I'll take it with me. I plan it as a surprise gift for my wife. The salesman's smile vanished. "'Then perhaps you could bring the lady here to our establishment?' "'No,' Gardner scowled. "'Why should I?' "'As I was endeavouring to explain, sir, "'the units are, of necessity, completely individualized. "'The controlling factor is the electronic wavelength of the owner's brain. "'As you know, the frequency of every human brain varies. "'No two are alike. "'That is the key to the whole concept of domestic two. "'We—' "'Will you quit babbly and get to the point?' Gardner bellowed. Tell me in simple words why I can't take the robot with me. Because, sir, the clerk answered in a frightened voice, to be of any value to your wife, the unit will have to be keyed to her brain frequency. Gardner stomped to the floor. Then you've wasted my time. We can't do business. My wife would never come down here. But the adjustment takes only a few minutes. We had a quarrel, you fool. She won't even unlock her bedroom door for me. The whole idea of this thing was something to surprise her out of her anger and bring about a reconciliation. Gardner was striding towards the door. The clerk was frantic. This sale would have got him company recognition. In desperation, he hurried after Gardner. May I make a suggestion, sir? Gardner turned. All right, make it. It occurred to me that you might have the unit attuned to your own frequency— temporarily, that is. You could present it to the lady, then at her leisure she could call here and have the frequency changed to correspond to her own. Gardner scowled. Well, why didn't you say that in the first place? How long does this adjustment take? Only a few minutes, the clerk said eagerly. If you will just step this way, sir, come, Raymond. Raymond sat hunched beside the chauffeur, who was a trifle nervous but the chauffeur hid his agitation because John Gardner paid well and had been known to discharge chauffeurs who displeased him and leave them standing on street corners without jobs. Gardner ordered him to turn and go back home. As they rode, Raymond stared straight ahead, a pleasant light glowing in his blue eyes. When the car stopped under the portico, Gardner said, "'Get out and open the door, Raymond.' The robot said, "'Yes, master,' and obeyed instantly. The chauffeur, shouldered aside by the robot, looked worried. Gardner noted this and enjoyed adding to the man's discomfort. "'Maybe they build one that can drive a car. In that case, I won't be needing you much longer.' Inside, the robot gently lifted Gardner's coat from his shoulders, hung it in the closet, then returned to Gardner's side. Have you any further wishes, master? Aladdin's genie come true, Gardner's thought, and amused himself for a few minutes putting the robot through a series of grotesque duties. 
amazing. Perhaps he would get one of these units for himself also. Then he turned his mind to Dolores. She was no doubt still in her room. But this new toy would make her forget their quarrel all right. He visualized her laughing interest. He could already see her clapping her hands like the child she was and rushing into his arms. Gardner turned to the robot. Raymond, go up the stairs and knock on the first door to your right. It is your mistress's room. Tell her I'm waiting. Bring her to me. The robot nodded, and Gardner thought a look of adoration glowed in its eyes. It said, Yes, master, and moved toward the stairs. Gardner sat down. He smiled to himself, anticipating the reunion. It wasn't every wife whose husband can go out and buy her a $30,000 toy. There was the crash of rending wood. The sound chilled Gardner, froze him so that the angry scream that followed was anti-climax. But it brought movement back into his legs, and he lunged toward the stairs. He bellowed an order. Too late. The robot was already descending. It carried the dead body of Dolores in its steel arms. Her head hung limply on a horribly twisted neck. She refused to come, master, the robot said. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now for the next story. The Builders by Fox B. Holden Originally published in Imagination Stories of Science and Fantasy, February 1951 Narrated by Tom Trussell Markton flew low over the sunlit ruins and wondered idly if he would find any more in them than he had found elsewhere on the planet. Looks as completely dead as all the rest, he said to his companion. New City has a big enough population anyhow, as far as I'm concerned. Not that it's important, I suppose. There's always plenty of space in which to expand, but you know what I mean. The younger occupant of the low-circling aircraft nodded his understanding. There'd be enough room on either side of the big mountains to take care of millions more of us, I guess. But I think you're right. Anyway, there isn't another nomad or ruined dweller on the planet. New City is as complete as it's going to be, and as you say, twelve million is enough. But do you think we'll find any more plans down there? Hard to say, Markton answered, levelling off the aircraft for a landing. But if there are traces of anything, I hope you'll keep your attention on what's of technical value and not waste time again on all that other stuff. None of us have ever bothered reading it. You can't build anything from it. No diagrams. To build is the only purpose of new city civilization. How could anything else be of importance? I've wondered off and on about that. But then... There is so little of anything left that it doesn't make much difference. Important thing is to find more diagrams. Glad you realise it. I've been a citizen of New City ever since the first few of us on this continent started building it forty years ago, and I can tell you, building things is all that's important. You'll realise that soon enough if you'd wandered around alone and useless, as I and a lot of other elders did for years. Markton brought the fast twin-engined aircraft into a perfect landing, cut the power, and set the brakes. The two left their seats and started getting field equipment together. They told us at the Academy that you elders wandered so far and for so long that you had permanently lost all memory of the past. Is that really true, Markton? It is. Not that it ever mattered. We all had forgotten from where we'd come and how we got where we were. I guess all we remembered was how to build, but then... As you said, building is all there is that important. They left the plane and started in the direction of what once had obviously been a city. To Markton and his young aide, the sight was nothing new. They had seen 
as had all the other members of the research builders division, thousands of others just like the one toward which they were now walking. Sometimes Markton thought it would have been a lot easier to have signed up with the production builders division, but that would have been dull. Always searching for new plans, building something new, that was more to his taste. The only trouble was, there seemed to be fewer and fewer new plans as the years went by. And now, even when you found some, you had to check its potentialities exhaustively before you started building it. Markton shuddered a little when he thought of some of the first things that had been built without pre-construction study for analysis as to its probable use. One of them would have blown New City off the face of the earth had it been put into operation in a metropolitan proving lab. Fortunately, the thing had been too big and had been taken for trial to a lab located in a southern desert. Today, there was still a ten-mile-wide crater in the sand where the thing had gone off. Production never got that model from research. There were some others of similar nature that they hadn't got too. That was why, these days, even if you dug something up, you were damn careful before you built it. Say, Markton. Yes? I was wondering about something. Eventually, we're bound to find all the plans there are. What happens when there aren't any more? Maybe then there'll be time for that other stuff I caught you wasting time on in the ruin we were in last week. There was a grin on Markton's thin face. But not until... No, seriously, Markton. The Division Academy instructors said there wasn't much left, and that was why we had to be especially well trained to find what little more there is. But what about after we do? And there just isn't any more. Just build more of what we got, of course. What else would there be to do? Well, well, you must be right, but production sure will be dull. There was only a thin edge of the sun still separating daylight from darkness as they forced entry into their tenth ruin, and Markton's tone was dejected. This, he said, has been a day wasted, and there's little possibility that we'll come up with anything here. Better get out your night lamp. Markton's young assistant obeyed, and started working his way into one of the few still-standing corridors. He moved cautiously, remembering his training. When exploration of ruins of shattered masonry is indicated, guard against unnecessary vibrations. The ruins yielded nothing but broken stone and twisted steel. There could, of course, be an obscured entrance to some lower level. Many amazing documents had been discovered in the almost untouched lower levels of what had seemed totally destroyed buildings when viewed only from the gutted streets. That was why it took so long to search a city, even though there often seemed nothing left to search. There could always be some spot undetectable but intact. When he found the opening that led downward, it was necessary to go through it and descend without contacting Markton. To shout would mean dangerous vibrations, and to go back could well mean hours of delay in rediscovering his find. The night lamp pushed relentlessly against the blackness that hung stagnant in the lower level, and picked out the stumbling blocks of debris which had to be moved as smoothly as their weights could permit. Some were larger than the young researcher himself, and he realised that the going would have been a lot better had he not rationalised about contacting Markton to make whatever finds there might be on his own. There were many brick and girder cluttered places that once had been rooms, but like so many other shattered interiors he had examined, all but stone and steel had been disintegrated by the unthinkable shock waves that must have accompanied what awful force it had been that had wrecked such havoc on the face of an entire globe. Objects made of less sturdy stuff had been literally torn molecule from molecule, atom from atom. The chance of discovery of a complete book had been computed as a near impossibility. The finding of a complete blueprint or set of diagrams was considered almost as hopeless. To find all the pieces of a plan which had merely been shattered was about the best that could be expected. And for forty years now, as Markton had said, 
It had been done by four million painstaking research builders. It was, in a way, amazing how so many thousands of different things had been built. The lamp's roving beam fingered something quickly, fell back into blackness, then was suddenly groping with the desperation of an almost uncontrolled excitement for what it touched and lost. It touched again. Should he find Mark now? No, not yet. Perhaps what he saw would be nothing. Pinned beneath one of the most massive steel girders he had yet seen, they were books, four books. Quickly, yet with his nervous system under a willed rigidity, he assembled the portable cutting torch and began freeing his one-in-a-million find from the great length of twisted steel which held it in a vice-like hold against an embedded section of stone flooring. Minutes ticked away. More than sixty of them were gone before the books were in his hands at last. Did they hold any plans? Diagrams never seen before by research. The titles. Carefully he deciphered them from the crushed covers. A History of the World, 1800 to 1962. The Psychology of Human Relations. The Philosophies of Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle. The fourth title he did not understand at all, because he could not read it. He knew only one of its three words, and it made even less sense than the other titles. Quickly he flipped through the volume for a possible hint of explanation, and there were diagrams, hundreds of them and one especially beautiful one, larger than the rest. It was necessary to unfold it from the book in colour. It was obviously the only important one of the four books. The others, from what it could gather from their rather vague titles, had nothing to do with building anything. But this one, with diagrams, obviously did. In a haste accompanied with what he knew to be too little caution, Markton's young aide hastened back the way he had come, sometimes stumbling in his anxiety to present his invaluable find to the elder, once almost falling. But it took only minutes until he found Markton, who was still examining the ruin on its ground level, near the large opening through which they had entered. Markton, look! There was an ominous rumbling sound, then a terrifying feeling of the vibration of disintegration. They bolted for the opening, even as the still-standing masonry which formed it began to topple. The rumbling increased to thunder volume, and the earth outside the collapsing ruin quaked beneath their running feet. When they finally stopped at a safe distance, their night lamps showed only a slowly rising cloud of pumice and dust. "'How often?' Markton said when it was at last over. "'Do you forget the fundamentals of your basic training?' Aye, it's done now, but the contents of whatever lower levels there may have been are lost to us for good. Nothing could have survived that, and we have never built a digging machine. There probably was nothing anyway but next time. Then Markton saw the book in his aide's hand. The look of disappointment on his features changed suddenly to one of disbelief, then to amazement. At least I saved this! It has diagrams, Markton. The cave-in I caused destroyed three other books, but they had no drawings in them at all. Here, see if you can understand the title. Let's get to the laboratory compartment of the plane, where we can see something. Great electrons, boy! What made you hold this back? Under the powerful lamps in the lab compartment of their aircraft, Markton and the finder of the book puzzled over the three words on its cover and flyleaf. Perhaps in one of the dictionaries at research headquarters. No, I don't think so, Markton mused. We'll look when we get back, but I don't think so. Hmm, doesn't make much difference. It's the diagrams that are important, and the entire book isn't incomprehensible. A lot of chemical terms, some electrical. I'm convinced already that these diagrams constitute a structure of a purely electrochemical nature, although something seems to be missing. And yet, 
At the headquarters lab, we can do a lot better than we can here, Markton, or we can hand it over right away to the Research Pre-Construction Study Division. Nothing doing. I hold a competence rating on that study business, young fellow. I'll study it for possible inherent dangers, exactly according to regulations, myself. And then whatever it is, we'll build it. But Markton, suppose— Markton had already seated himself at the controls of the craft, switched on the take-off lights, and started the powerful engines. Above the roar of the engines as they warmed for take-off, Markton's assistant could still detect the undertones of excitement in the elder's voice. It's something different, completely different, that you've found, not just an improved design or a variation such as we've had to be content with for the past five years. This is new. I'm positive of it. There was, of course, little sense in doubting the word of an elder. That was part of training. Another part which Markton's aide had not forgotten had also said, however, that there could always be danger in a too cursory pre-construction study of any new discovery. And then, of course, there were those other things that he had read which Markton had said were such a complete waste of time. They began construction work from the large coloured diagram less than a month after the book containing it had been discovered. The diagram itself, of course, had been enlarged to its full scale and had other sectional diagrams that Markton said definitely were part of the same thing, but drawn separately in the book to render greater detail. Two things had almost stumped the elder completely, however, before he announced his pre-construction studies finished, and that he was prepared to begin actual construction. There were odours in the laboratory which his aide's nostril had never experienced before. He wondered if they were as new to Markton. I admit, Markton said the day he began work on the two specially constructed oblong vats filled with a fluid Markton called formaldehyde. I am puzzled about the power source. Obviously a chain of electrochemical reactions, but stemming from where? That's what I've got to find out. Also, I've had to add another full-scale diagram drawn up. There was another coloured one we missed. It was on a regular page. Have a look. His aide's less experienced eyes examined the second full-scale drawing Markton had made. It's smaller and different, sort of, but yet it's the same. Maybe... Maybe one is just an improved model over the other. One a later development, you think? Why not? That's what I've been wondering. But no. My studies show that neither has any greater power potential to any marked degree, that is, than the other. Both structures seem to have almost exactly the same electrochemical potentialities. But for some reason, just the same, they are different. The original designers leave no clue in the book? No, just formulae, and the usual stuff we find with diagrams. You know, Markton, I've often wondered about whoever it was. There you go, forgetting one of the basics of training again. Of sole importance is a discovery itself. Its origination is a thing of the past, and the past being dead is therefore of no importance. I remember... But you have confused me, Markton. With these two problems unresolved, can you at the same time pronounce construction a safe venture? I can, because neither of the unknowns is relative to the power potential which I have ascertained to be required tolerances. Neither of them are based on a framework of nuclear physics, anyway, and I have discovered no possibility of chemical reaction which would render anything than a slow oxidation process. Therefore, youngster, to solve for the two unknown quantities, power source and construction variation, we must build. Markton was an elder, so the trace of excitement in his voice was excusable. His decision was not to be questioned. Yet, Markton, I have a peculiar feeling about this. A peculiar what? Well, I... Are you questioning my pre-construction study? Markton's tone was suddenly flat, yet charged with authority. Of course not, sir. Here are untried, absolutely new diagrams, 
we must build that is our purpose now we will begin the larger one first i think they labored on the project for three months they finished the structure in the large vat first and Martin left the job of completing the smaller one to his assistant while he drained the larger vat of its original fluid, dried the completed structure, and placed a series of L-type electrodes at various spots on the exterior. The smaller one came out to look quite a lot different, Martin. I'll have it ready for the first series of charges by the time you have that one going. I don't understand, however, what good the charges will do when there isn't any power source to activate. Making either of them work might be a problem, but somehow I don't think so, Martin replied. The whole setup, devoid of any central power unit as it seems to be, is designed in such a way that electrochemical reactions of some sort should take place with the first series of charges. A few rearrangements of electrodes might be necessary. During the next four hours, Martin's assistant worked with extra speed so that he was able to have the smaller vat drained and the electrode placement diagrammed for his own use. Through what process of logic, he asked Markton as he neared his last set of adjustments, did you make your decision concerning a primary charge for the inducement of the electrochemical reactions of which you spoke? You may inscribe in your apprentice journal, the elder said as he prepared a dynamo for use, that insofar as the logic of the situation was concerned, I simply applied the physical truth that an object at rest tends to remain at rest until acted upon by some outside force. Since the objects in this case are ingredients of a chemical nature specifically constructed for electrical conduction, the only possible solution is to activate them through application of an electromotive force. If the logic had been faulty, of course, Markton paused a moment then we will know that there has simply been an error in construction. However, we have been precise in every step. They will work. What they will do, naturally, rests in theory. Something of an electrical nature in accordance with your logic, correct? Precisely. And if I'm wrong, and they prove of no use at all, we'll dismantle them and inform research library that any further such diagrams discovered are worthless. The assistant straightened from his work. Finished? Markton asked. I am. You know, though, even though they aren't exactly the same, they have a peculiar similarity, too. We built according to specifications. Ready? Go ahead, Markton. Markton first reduced the penetrating power of the laboratory operation lamps to a subdued softness. The smooth metal walls of the rectangularly shaped laboratory seemed to melt away to nothingness, and most of the bluish light was focused on the contents of the two vats. Markton pressed a control. There was no sound as the electrical impulses surged through the structures they had made, and the silence itself seemed a part of their stillness. There was a faint odour now of ozone. Markton glanced at dials. Try a temperature test. See if the materials are withstanding the amperage. I will cut the current at your signal. Markton's assistant obeyed. I don't understand, he said. At completion they were room temperature, 68.7 calibrations. Now exactly 98.6 calibrations. Yet the resistance of their chemical constituents would not warrant... Any damage? Tissue breakdown? None I can see. Martin, the big one moved. Then the smaller one moved too. Both of them sat up. For the moment, Martin and his aide looked only at each other, the younger of the two speechless, incredulity on his features. Martin smiled. I was not sure, he said, but as you said, they do appear similar to us. They are chemical automatons. I suspected, but of course could not be sure. Now we must discover the exact power source, and, more importantly, the control centres of the things, then. But on these counts, Martin was doomed to disappointment. Aside from his discovery that the things he had created would not function properly without ingesting large amounts of different types of vegetable and organic materials, 
and that they operated independently of any outside stimulus, he was able to discover nothing more, except when at length he had concluded that neither of the things could be of any use to the populace of New City, because they could be neither electrically or mechanically directed by any type of control yet built. He discovered that they actually resisted any attempts to dismantle them. They ran. Peculiar, he said. Shall I pursue them? his apprentice asked. They appear to be heading in the direction of the grasslands to the north. Never mind, Markton sounded dejected. They have very low unit power potential. They could never do any harm to anything. I wish we knew what those three words on the book meant. Advanced human anatomy. Nothing too important, really. Or we'd have known their meaning. Well, there will be other things to build, and we need energy. Let's go to maintenance and recharge our plates. Good thought. I guess those things wouldn't have been strong enough to build anything anyway. At any rate, they can't be dangerous. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. A Bad Day for Sales by Fritz Lieber Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction, July 1953. Narrated by Tom Trissel. The big bright doors of the office building parted with a pneumatic whoosh, and Robbie glided onto Times Square. The crowd that had been watching the fifty-foot-tall girl on the clothing billboard get dressed, or reading the latest news about the hot truce scrawled itself in yard-high script, hurried to look. Robbie was still a novelty. Robbie was fun. For a little while yet he could steal the show. But the attention did not make Robbie proud. He had no more emotions than the pink plastic giantess, who dressed and undressed endlessly whether there was a crowd or the street was empty, and who never once blinked her blue mechanical eyes. But she merely drew business, while Robbie went out after it. For Robbie was the logical conclusion of the development of vending machines. All the earlier ones had stood in one place, on a floor or hanging on a wall, and blankly delivered merchandise in return for coins, whereas Robbie searched for customers. He was the demonstration model of a line of sales robots to be manufactured by Schuler vending machines, provided the public invested enough in stocks to give the company capital to go into mass production. The publicity Robbie drew stimulated investments handsomely. It was amusing to see the TV and newspaper coverage of Robbie selling, but not a fraction as much fun as being approached personally by him. Those who were usually bought anywhere from one to five hundred shares, if they had any money and foresight enough to see that sales robots would eventually be on every street and highway in the country. Robbie radared the crowd, found that it had surrounded him solidly, and stopped. With a carefully built-in sense of timing, he waited for the tension and expectation to mount before he began talking. Say, Ma! He doesn't look like a robot at all, a child said. He looks like a turtle. Which was not completely inaccurate. The lower part of Robbie's body was a metal hemisphere hemmed with a sponge rubber and not quite touching the sidewalk. The upper was a metal box with black holes in it. The box could swivel and duck. A chromium bright hoop skirt with a turret on top. "'Reminds me too much of the little Joe Paratanks,' a legless veteran of the Persian War muttered, and rapidly rolled himself away on wheels rather like Robbie's. His departure made it easier for some of those who knew about Robbie to open a path in the crowd. Robbie headed straight for the gap. The crowd whooped. Robbie glided very slowly down the path, deftly jogging aside, 
whenever he got too close to ankles in Skylon or Socassins. The rubber buffer on his hoop skirt was merely an added safeguard. The boy who had called Robbie a turtle jumped in the middle of the path and stood his ground, grinning foxily. Robbie stopped two feet short of him. The turret ducked. The crowd got quiet. "'Hello, youngster,' Robbie said in a voice that was smooth as that of a TV star, and was, in fact, a recording of one. The boy stopped smiling. "'Hello,' he whispered. "'How old are you?' Robbie asked. Nine, No, eight. "'That's nice,' Robbie observed. A metal arm shot down from his neck, stopped just short of the boy. The boy jerked back. "'For you,' Robbie said. The boy gingerly took the red polylop from the neatly fashioned blunt metal claws and began to unwrap it. "'Nothing to say?' asked Robbie. "'Er, uh, thank you.' After a suitable pause, Robbie continued. "'And how about a nice refreshing drink of poppy-pop to go with your polylop?' The boy lifted his eyes, but didn't stop licking the candy. Robbie waggled his claws slightly. "'Just give me a quarter, and within five seconds—' A little girl wriggled out of the forest of legs. "'Give me a polylop too, Robbie!' she demanded. "'Rita, come back here!' a woman in the third rank of the crowd called angrily. Robbie scanned the newcomer gravely. His reference silhouettes were not good enough to let him distinguish the sex of children, so he merely repeated, "'Hello, youngster! Rita, give me a polylop!' Disregarding both remarks, for a good salesman is single-minded and does not waste bait, Robbie said winningly, "'I'll bet you read Junior Space Killers. Now I have here—' "'Uh-huh, I'm a girl. He got a polylop!' At the word girl, Robbie broke off. Rather ponderously, he said, "'I'll bet you read G. G. Jones, Space Stripper. Now I have here the latest issue of that thrilling comic, not yet in the stationary vending machines. Just give me fifty cents, and within five— "'Please let me through. I'm her mother.' A young woman in the front rank drawled over a powder-sprayed shoulder. "'I'll get her for you,' and slithered out on six-inch platform shoes. "'Run away, children,' she said nonchalantly. Lifting her arms behind her head, she pirouetted slowly before Robbie to show how much she did for her bolero half-jacket and her form-fitting slacks that melted into Skylon just above the knees. The little girl glared at her. She ended the pirouette in profile. At this age level, Robbie's reference silhouettes permitted him to distinguish sex, though with occasional amusing and embarrassing miscalls. He whistled admiringly. The crowd cheered. Someone remarked critically to a friend, "'It would go up better if it was built more like a real robot. You know, like a man.' The friend shook his head. "'This way is subtler.' No one in the crowd was watching the new script overhead as it scribbled. Ice pack for hot truce? Vanadin hints Russ may yield on Pakistan. Robbie was saying, In the savage new glamour tint we have christened Mars blood, complete with spray applicator and fit all finger stalls that mask each finger completely except for the nail. Just give me five dollars. Uncrumpled bills may be fed into the revolving rollers you see beside my arm, and within five seconds— No thanks, Robbie, the young woman yawned. Remember, Robbie persisted, for three more weeks, seductivizing Mars blood will be unobtainable from any other robot or human vendor. No thanks. Robbie scanned the crowd resourcefully. Is there any gentleman here? He began just as a woman elbowed her way through the front rank. "'I told you to come back,' she snapped at the little girl. "'But I didn't get my polylop.' "'Who would care to?' "'Rita!' "'Robbie cheated! Ow!' Meanwhile, the young woman in the half-bolero had scanned the nearby gentleman on her own. 
deciding that there was less than a 50% chance of any of them accepting the proposition Robbie seemed about to make. She took advantage of the scuffle to slither gracefully back into the ranks. Once again the path was clear before Robbie. He paused, however, for a brief recapitulation of the more magical properties of Mars blood, including a telling phrase about the passionate claws of a Martian sunrise. But no one bought. It wasn't quite time. Soon enough, silver coins would be clinking, bills going through the rollers faster than laundry, and five hundred people struggling for the privilege of having their money taken away from them by America's first mobile sales robot. But there were still some tricks that Robbie had to do free, and one certainly should enjoy those before starting the more expensive fun. So Robbie moved on until he reached the curb. The variation in level was instantly sensed by his underscanners. He stopped. His head began to swivel. The crowd watched in eager silence. This was Robbie's best trick. Robbie's head stopped swivelling. His scanners had found the traffic light. It was green. Robbie edged forward. But then the light turned red. Robbie stopped again, still on the curb. The crowd softly ahed it at its delight. It was wonderful to be alive and watching Robbie on such an exciting day, alive and amused in the fresh weather-controlled air between the lines of bright skyscrapers with their winking windows and under a sky so blue you could almost call it dark. But way, way up, where the crowd could not see, the sky was darker still, purple dark, with stars showing, and in that purple dark a silver-green something, the colour of a bud, plunged down at better than three miles a second. The silver-green was a newly developed paint that foiled radar. Robbie was saying, While we wait for the light, there's time for you youngsters to enjoy a nice refreshing poppy-pop. Or, for you adults, only those over five feet tall are eligible to buy, to enjoy an exciting poppy-pop fizz. Just give me a quarter, or, in the case of adults, one dollar and a quarter. I'm licensed to dispense intoxicating liquors, and within five seconds... But that was not cutting it quite fine enough. Just three seconds later, the silver-green bud bloomed above Manhattan into a globular orange flower. The skyscrapers grew brighter and brighter still, the brightness of the inside of the sun. The windows winked blossoming white fire flowers. The crowd around Robbie bloomed too, their clothes puffed into petals of flame. Their heads of hair were torches. The orange flower grew, stem and blossom. The blast came. The winking windows, shattered tier by tier, became black holes. The walls bent, rocked, cracked. A stony dandruff flaked from their cornices. The flaming flowers of the sidewalk were all levelled at once. Robbie was shoved ten feet. His metal hoop skirt dimpled, regaining its shape. The blast ended. The orange flower, grown vast, vanished overhead on its huge magic beanstalk. It grew dark and very still. The cornice dandruff pattered down. A few small fragments rebounded from the metal hoop skirt. Robbie made some small, uncertain movements, as if feeling for broken bones. He was hunting for the traffic light, but it no longer shone either red nor green. He slowly scanned a full circle. There was nothing anywhere to interest his reference silhouettes. Yet whenever he tried to move, his underscanners warned him of low obstructions. It was very puzzling. The silence was disturbed by moans and a crackling sound, as faint at first as the scampering of distant rats. 
a seared man, his charred clothes fuming where the blast had blown out the fire, rose from the curb. Robbie scanned him. "'Good day, sir,' Robbie said. "'Would you care for a smoke? A truly cool smoke. Now I have here a yet unmarketed brand.' But the customer had run away, screaming, and Robbie never ran after customers, though he could follow them at a medium brisk roll. He worked his way along the curb where the man had sprawled, carefully keeping his distance from the low obstructions, some of which writhed now and then, forcing him to jog. Shortly he reached a fire hydrant. He scanned it. His electronic vision, though it still worked, had been somewhat blurred by the blast. "'Hello, youngster,' Robbie said. Then, after a long pause, "'Cat got your tongue? Well, I have a little present for you. A nice, lovely polylop. "'Take it, youngster,' he said, after another pause. "'It's for you. Don't be afraid.' His attention was distracted by other customers, who began to rise up oddly here and there, twisting forms that confused his reference silhouettes and would not stay to be scanned properly. One cried, Water! But no quarter clinked his Robbie's claws when he caught the word and suggested, How about a nice refreshing drink of Poppy Pop? The rat crackling of the flames had become a jungle muttering. The blind windows began to wink fire again. A little girl marched, stepping neatly over arms and legs she did not look at. A white dress and the once taller bodies around her had shielded her from the brilliance and the blast. Her eyes were fixed on Robbie. In them was the same imperious confidence, though none of the delight, with which she had watched him earlier. "'Help me, Robbie,' she said. "'I want my mother.' "'Hello, youngster,' Robbie said. "'What would you like? Comics? Candy? "'Where is she, Robbie? Take me to her.' "'Balloons? Would you like to watch me blow up a balloon?' The little girl began to cry. The sound triggered off another of Robbie's novelty circuits, a service feature that had brought in a lot of favourable publicity. "'Is something wrong?' he asked. "'Are you in trouble? Are you lost?' "'Yes, Robbie. Take me to my mother.' "'Stay right there,' Robbie said reassuringly, "'and don't be frightened. I will call a policeman.' He whistled shrilly, twice. Time passed. Robbie whistled again. The windows flared and roared. The little girl begged, "'Take me away, Robbie,' and jumped onto a little step in his hoop-skirt. "'Give me a dime,' Robbie said. The little girl found one in her pocket and put it in his claws. "'Your weight,' Robbie said, "'is fifty-four and one-half pounds.' "'Have you seen my daughter? Have you seen her?' a woman was crying somewhere. I left her watching that thing when I stepped inside. Rita! Robbie, help me! The little girl began babbling at her. He knew I was lost. He even called the police, but they didn't come. He weighed me too, didn't you, Robbie? But Robbie had gone off to peddle Poppy Pop to the members of a rescue squad which had just come around the corner, more robot-like in their asbestos suits than he in his metal skin. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. All Jackson's Children by Daniel F. Galuyi Originally published in Galaxy, January 1957 Narrated by Tom Trussell Angus McIntosh vigorously scuffed the tarnished nameplate on the wrecked cargo carrier. Then he stepped back and squinted under shaggy grey eyebrows. Letter by letter, number by number, he
He coaxed out the designation on the crumpled bow of the spacer in the vine-matted gorge. Art he? Three zero seven zero. V G. Dash, I I. His lean frame tensed with concern as he turned to stare soberly at the other. A vegan robot trader. Bruce Drummond grinned. Are we lucky? Clunkers are worth money, in any condition. Angus snorted impatiently. Let's get out of here, quick. Get out, the stocky Drummond repeated incredulously as he ran thick-set fingers over the black stubble on his cheek. Ain't we going to salvage the clunkers? The book says they're ours after fifty years. The hold's empty. There's no cargo. There was when it landed. Look at the angle of incidence on those fins. Exactly. Frowning, Angus shifted his holster around on his hip and strode back toward the plane. Ever heard of a frustrated compulsion? Drummond, following hesitantly, shook his head. Those clunkers have to satisfy a basic behaviour circuit, Macintosh explained as he hastened his step. We don't know what the compulsion of this bunch is. Suppose, well, suppose they have a chiropractic function. How do you like to be the first person to show up after they've been frustrated for a hundred years? Oh, Drummond said comprehendingly, stumbling to keep pace. Angus Mackintosh brushed a mass of tendrils aside and stepped out on the plane. We'll report it and let them send in a deactivation crew. That way, at least, we'll get fifty per cent of salvage and no danger. Even that ain't bad, just for following an SOS a hundred light years. Taking an uncharted route and picking up that signal sure paid off like... Drummond gagged on his words as he gripped Angus's arm and pointed. Their ship was a shining oval, bobbing and weaving on a sea of silver that surged across the plain toward a cliff on the left. Clunkers! Drummond gasped. Hundreds of them! Making off with our boat! He unholstered his weapon and fired. Angus struck his wrist sharply. Why don't you just run out, waving your arms? We don't have enough firepower to get more than eight or ten of them. But the warning was too late. Already the tide had washed away from the ship and was surging toward the gorge. There was a noise behind them, and Angus spun around. Ten feet away stood a robot with a designation RA-204 on his breastplate. "'Welcome, O Jackson!' the clunker said reverently. Then he hinged forward on his hip joints until his head almost touched the ground. The gesture was a clockwork's alarm. Mackintosh's thin legs dangled in front of 204's breastplate, and his ankles were secure in the grip of metal fingers as he rode the robot's shoulders. RA-76 strode alongside, carrying a squirming and swearing Drummond. Around them, the shining horde marched along noisily. "'He has come!' cried one. "'Jackson has come!' chanted the others of the shining horde. "'He will show us the way!' shouted R.A. 204. Drummond kicked, but 76 only held his legs more firmly. Furious, Drummond reached for his gun. "'That's using your head,' Angus said sarcastically. "'Agitate them. They will never get out of here.' Drummond let the weapon slip back into its holster. "'What do we get into, a nest of fanatics? Who's Jackson?' Angus helplessly shrugged his bony shoulders. The procession filtered through a narrow woods and broke out on another plain, headed for the nearby cliff. Angus leaned forward. "'Put me down, 204.' "'Thou art Jackson,' said the robot solemnly, and thou art testing me to see whether I would so easily abandon my supervisor. Not testing, Angus said, just asking. Come on, how about it? Praise Jackson, 204 cried. Jackson, Jackson, intoned the throng. Drummond leaned an elbow on 76's skull plate and disgustedly cupped his chin in his hands. What if they are chiropractor robots? We probably need one after this ride, Angus said uncomfortably. 
Not like we'll need a way to get back to this ship and cut off those converters before they overcharge. Slow charge? Angus asked between grunts timed with 204's stride. Hell no! I didn't think we'd be here more than a couple of hours. But tomorrow at this time there'll be a crater out there big enough to bury the Capellan fleet. Great, said Angus. That gives us another thing to worry about. The robots fell into two groups as they neared a cave in the cliff. "'Jackson is my supervisor,' chanted the ones on the right. "'I shall not rust,' answered those on the left. "'He maketh me to adjust my joint tension,' cried the first group. "'Oh, brother,' said Drummond. "'Sounds like a psalm,' suggested Angus. "'You ought to know. You always got your nose in that Bible. "'Notice anything peculiar about them?' "'Very funny,' sneered Drummond at the question. "'No, I'm serious.' "'They bounce the daylights out of you when they walk,' Drummond grumbled. "'No, they're Finnish. It's shiny, like they were fresh out of the factory, not like they've been marooned here for a hundred years.' Drummond scratched his chin. "'Maybe their compulsion is metal polishing. Not with the kind of fingers they have.' Angus indicated the hand that held his ankle. Three digits were wrenches of various sizes. The index finger was a screwdriver. The thumb was a Stilson wrench. The thumb, on the other hand, was a disc-like appendage. Drummond hunched over. Seventy-six, what's your function? The robot looked up. To serve Jackson. You're a big help, said Drummond. "'Why dost thou tempt us, O Jackson?' asked R.I. 204. "'Wouldst thou test our beliefs?' "'We're no gods,' Angus declared as a robot drew up before the cave. "'Thou art Jackson,' insisted 204. Drummond and Mackintosh were hoisted to a ledge beside the mouth of the cave. The robots backed off, forming a half-circle, and bowed in obeisance. Angus ran a hand helplessly through his sparse grey hair. "'Would you say there are four hundred of them?' "'At least,' Drummond surveyed the expanse of metal bodies. "'You know, maybe they don't have a function.' "'Impossible. Hasn't been a clunker in five hundred years without a primary compulsion.' "'Think they forgot theirs?' "'Can't. They may forget how to put it in words, but the compulsion is good for as long as their primary banks are intact.' That's not what's worrying me, though. No? Religious robots! There can't be any such brand. Yet here they are. Drummond studied them silently. Before there can be theological beliefs, Mackintosh went on, there has to be some sort of foundation. The mystery of origin, the fear of death, the concept of the hereafter. Clunkers know they come from a factory. They know that when they're finally disassembled, There'll be lifeless scrap metal. Drummond spat disdainfully. One thing's for sure. This pack thinks we're God Almighty. Jackson Almighty, Angus corrected somberly. Well, God or Jackson, we'd better get back to the ship, or this is going to be a long visitation. Drummond faced the almost prostrate robots and made a megaphone of his hands. All right, you guys. How's about knocking it off? Slowly the robots reared erect, waiting. Take us back to our ship! RA-204 stepped forward. Again thou art testing us, old Jackson. Angus spread his arms imploringly. Look, fellows, we're men, we're— Thou art our supervisor! The throng roared. One of you is Jackson, explained 204. The other is a divine test— we must learn which is the true supervisor. You're not being tested, Mackintosh insisted. Our beliefs are firm, O oh Jackson, cried a hundred metallic voices. Thou art the supervisor, declared two or four resolutely. For God's sake, urged Drummond, tell him you're the Jackson and then lay down the law. No, can't do it that way. Why not? Unfair advantage, I suppose. There was a cutting edge on the younger man's words. Angus stared thoughtfully at the robots. If we only knew how they forgot their origin, how they got religion, we might find a way to get through to them. 
Drummond laughed contemptuously. "'You figure it out. I am going to play Jackson and get back to the ship.' He turned toward the robots. But Mackintosh caught his arm. "'Let me try something else first. He faced the horde below. "'Who made you?' "'Thou hast, O oh supervisor,' the robots chanted like a gleeful Sunday school class. "'And thou hadst put us on this world, and robot begot robot until we were as we are today,' added 204 solemnly. Drummond slapped the heel of his hand against his forehead. "'Now they think they've got a sex function.' Angus's shoulders fell dismally. "'Maybe if we try to figure out their designation. They're all R.A.'s, whatever the A stands for.' There was a hollow rumbling in the cave that grew in volume until the cliff shook. Then a second group of robots emerged and fanned out to encircle the ledge. "'Hell!' said Drummond, in consternation. "'There's twice as many as we figured.' "'Thought there'd be more,' Angus admitted. "'That ship was big enough to hold a thousand clunkers, and they didn't waste space in those days.' The newcomers fell prostrate alongside the others. The planet's single satellite hung like a lost gem over the low mountains east of the plain. It washed the cliff with a cloak of effulgence and bathed the forbidden ship in an aura of gleaming silver. Below the ledge, the reverent robots wavered occasionally and highlights of coruscation played capriciously across their plates. Their whispered invocations were a steady drone like the soft touch of the wind. Quit it! Drummond yelled angrily, "'Break it up! Go home!' Angus sat with his head against the cliff, face tilted up. "'That didn't help any. When are they going to give up?' Mackintosh glanced abstractedly at the horde. "'How long would we keep it up if our god appeared among us?' Drummond swore. "'Damned if you haven't been reading that print off that Bible!' "'What do you suppose happened?' Angus went on heedlessly, to make them more than clunkers, to make them grope for the basic truths. Drummond spat disgustedly in answer. Civilization goes on for a hundred years, Angus said as he leaned back and closed his eyes, spreading across a hunk of the galaxy, carrying along its knowledge and religious convictions. And all the while, there's this little lost island of mimic beliefs, so much like our own creed, except that their god is called Jackson. Drummond rose and paced. Well, we'll have plenty of time to set them straight, if we're still sitting on this shelf eleven hours from now. Maybe that's what it'll take, bringing them step by step through theology. Overnight? No, not overnight, Angus realised. It would take months to pound in new convictions. Drummond slipped down from the ledge. "'Here goes nothing.' Interestedly, Angus folded his arms and watched the other square his shoulders and march off confidently through the ranks of robots toward the ship in the distance. For a moment it seemed that he would succeed, but two of the RAs suddenly reared erect and seized him by the arms. They bore him on the shoulders and deposited him back on the ridge beside Mackintosh. "'Warm tonight.' Drummond observed bitterly, glancing up at the sky. "'Sure is,' Angus agreed, his voice calm. "'Wouldn't be surprised if we got some rain tomorrow.' Drummond flipped another pebble, and it pinged down on a metal back. Seven out of thirteen. Getting good. "'Look, let's tell them we're their supervisor and end this marathon worship. "'Which one of us is going to play the divine role?' "'What difference does it make?' Angus shrugged, and his tired eyes stared off into the darkness. "'One of us is... Jackson. The other is an imposter, brought here to test their faith. When they find out which is which, what are they going to do to the imposter?' Drummond looked startled. "'I see what you mean.' The miniature moon had wheeled its way to the zenith, and now the first grey tinge of dawn silhouetted the peaks of the mountain range. Angus rose and stretched. We've got to find out what their function is. Why? 
It looks like religion is their only interest, but maybe that's because they're completely frustrated in their basic compulsion. If we could discover their function, maybe we could focus our attention back on it. R.A., Drummond mumbled puzzledly. Robot agriculturist? Angus shook his head. They wouldn't be frustrated, not with a whole planet to farm. Besides, they'd be equipped with agricultural implements instead of wrenches. Drummond got up suddenly. You figure it out. I have something else to try. Angus followed him along the ledge until they reached the mouth of the cave. What are you going to do? Drummond hitched his trousers. The way we're ringed in here, it's a cinch we won't get past them in the six hours we are left. So you're going to make off through the cave? The younger man nodded. They might take off after me. They'll give you a chance to get to the ship and cut off those converters before they make like a nova. Angus chuckled. Suppose half of them decide to stay here with me? Drummond swore impatiently at his scepticism. At any rate, one of us might get back to the converters. And leave the other here? He can say he's Jackson, and order an attack in force on the ship. I don't follow you. Skidding the ship in a circle with the exhaust blowers on, Drummond explained patiently, will take care of ten thousand clunkers. He dropped from the ledge and raced into the cave. None of the robots stirred. Either they hadn't noticed Drummond's departure, Angus reasoned, or they weren't concerned because they knew the cave led nowhere. The sun came up, daubing the cliff with splotches of orange and purple, and striking up scintillations in the beds of dew on the robots' back. And still the tiresomely shouted veneration continued. Angus paced the ledge, stopping occasionally to stare into the impenetrable shadows of the cave. He checked his watch. Five hours to go. Five hours. And then time would be meaningless for the rest of his life, with his ship destroyed. It was unlikely that rescue would come. The wrecked space's automatic distress signals had gone out in an ever-expanding sphere for a hundred years, and he and Drummond had been the only humans to hear them. Trade routes were pretty stable in this section of the galaxy now, and it was hardly possible that, within the next ten or twenty years, one would be opened up that would intercept the SOS that had lured them here. He stood up and surveyed the robots. RA-204. 204 rear direct. Yes, Jackson. One of us is gone. We know, O oh Supervisor. Why did you let him get away? If he is not the true Jackson, it doesn't matter that he fled. If he is the Supervisor, he will return. Otherwise, why did he come here to us in the first place? Another robot straightened. We are ashamed, O oh Jackson, that we have failed the divine test and have not recognised our true Supervisor. Angus held up his arms for silence. Once there was a cargo of robots. That was a hundred years ago. The ship was from Vega too. It developed trouble and crashed when it tried to land on this planet. There was... What's a year, O Supervisor? asked 204. A Vega too, Jackson, said 76 bewilderedly. What's a planet? another wanted to know. Mackintosh leaned back hopelessly against the cliff. All of their memories and a good deal of the vocabularies had been lost. He could determine how much only through days of conversation. It would take weeks to learn the function and rekindle a sense of duty sufficiently strong to draw their interest away from religion. Unless... He drew resolutely erect. Strip the converters! Pull the aft tube lining! The robots looked uncomprehendingly at him. It was obvious they weren't trained for spacecraft maintenance. But it had to have something to do with mechanics. A battle fleet is orbiting at one diameter. Arm all warheads on the double. 
They stared helplessly at one another, then back at Angus. Not ordnance men. Pedestrian strip number two is jammed. Crane crew, muster on the right. The robots shifted uncertainly. Apparently they weren't civic maintenance men either. Defeated, Angus scanned their blank face plates. For a moment it was almost as though he could discern expressions of confusion. Then he laughed at the thought that metal could accommodate a frown. Suddenly the robots shifted their gaze to the cave. Drummond, shoulders sagging dismally, walked out and squinted against the glare. Several of the robots started toward him. OK, OK, he growled, heading back for the ledge before they could reach him. No luck? Angus asked. Disgusted, Drummond clambered up beside him. The cave's just a nice sized room. Took you two hours to find that out? The younger man shook his head. I was hiding by the entrance, waiting for the clunkers to break it up and give me a chance to run for the ship. How many robots did we decide there were? About eight hundred. Wrong. You can add another four hundred or so. In the cave? Drummond nodded. Were their parts spread all the way from here to Helen back? Dismantled? Down to the last nut and bolt. They've even got their secondary memory bank stripped. Angus was thoughtfully silent a long while. R.A., he said finally. Robot assembler! That's what I figured. Drummond turned back towards the robots and funneled his voice through his hands. OK, you clunkers, I want all odd-numbered RAs stripped down for reconditioning. He glanced at Angus. When they get through, I'll have half of what's left stripped the other half, and so forth. Macintosh grinned caustically. Brilliant! The whole operation shouldn't take more than two or three days. And his face took on a grim cast. Drummond... We've only got four hours left to get to those converters. But you don't understand. Once they get started, they'll be so busy we'll probably be able to walk away. Angus smiled indulgently. Once they get started. He nodded toward the robots. They had all returned to their attitude of veneration. It won't work, Macintosh explained. Their obsession with religion is stronger than their primary compulsion. That's probably because they've been satisfying their compulsion all along. He jerked a thumb in the direction of the cave. Drummond swore venomously. Angus dropped down on the ledge and folded his knees in his arms. He felt his age bearing down on him for the first time. Twelve hundred robots, he said meditatively. Twelve hundred RA robots out of touch with civilization for a century, satisfying their primary function by disassembling and assembling one another, going at it in shifts, splitting themselves into three groups. That device on the left thumb, Drummond interrupted, it's a burnisher, that's why they're so shiny. Angus nodded. Three groups. Group A spent so many months stripping and reassembling Group B. Meanwhile, Group C, which has just been put together again, has no memory because their secondary banks have been wiped clean. So like children, they learn from the working Group A. Drummond's mouth hung open in shocked understanding. And by the time A finishes the job, C's education is complete, and it's A's turn to be stripped. By then, Angus went on, Group C is not only ready to start stripping Group A, but has also become intellectually mature enough to begin the education of the reassembled Group B. They sat still for a while, thinking it over. The compulsion to do their jobs, Macintosh continued, is unchanged because the primary function banks are sealed circuits and can't be tampered with. But in each generation, they have their secondary memory circuits wiped clean and have to start all over getting whatever general knowledge they can from the last generation. Drummond snapped his fingers excitedly. That's why they don't know what we are. Their idea of man had to be passed down by word of mouth, and it got all distorted in the process. 
Angus's stare, more solicitous now, swept slowly over the prostrate robots. More important, that's why they developed a religion. What's the main difference between human and robotic intelligence? It's that our span of life is limited on one end by birth, the other by death, mysteries of origin and destiny that can't be explained. You see, the ordinary clunker understands where he came from and where he's going. But here are robots who have to struggle with those mysteries, birth and death of the conscious intellect which they themselves once knew and forgot and now have turned into myths. So they start thinking in terms of religion, Drummond said. Well, that clears up the whole thing, doesn't it? Not quite. It doesn't explain why the religion they have invented parallels ours so closely. And it doesn't tell us who Jackson is. Drummond ran thick fingernails against the stubble on his cheeks. Jackson is my supervisor. I shall not rust. He maketh me to adjust my joint tension. He stopped and frowned. I have heard that before somewhere, only it sounded different. Angus gave him a wry, tired smile. Sure, it's practically the psalm of David. Now you see why the resemblance is driving me batty. The robots stirred. Several of them stood up and plodded into the cave. The others continued repeating their endless praise and devotion, prayers in every sense of the word, except common sense. Angus leaned back against the cliff and let the sun's heat warm him. "'Somehow it doesn't seem fair,' he commented unhappily. "'What doesn't?' Drummond asked. "'They're so close to the truth. Yet, after we file a report, a deactivation crew will come along and erase their beliefs.' They'll have their memory bank swept clean, and once more there'll be nothing but clunkers with a factory specification job of routine work to do. Ain't that what they're supposed to be? But these are different. They've found something no clunkers ever had before. Hope, faith, aspiration beyond death. He shook his head ruefully. There was movement at the mouth of the cave, and the smaller group of robots emerged from the shadows, two of them bearing a stone slab. Their steps were ceremoniously slow as they approached the ledge. Bowing, they placed the tablet at Angus's feet and backed away. "'These are the articles of our faith, O Jackson,' one announced. "'We have preserved them for thy coming.' Mackintosh stared down at the charred remains of a book. Its metal fibre binding was shredded and fused and encrusted with the dust of ages. Drummond knelt beside it and, with stiff fingers, brushed away the film of grime, uncovering part of the title. O-L-Y B-I-B-E Eagerly, Angus eased the cover back. Of the hundreds of pages that originally contained, only flaked parts of two or three remained. The printing was scarcely legible on the mouldy paper. He read aloud those words he could discern. To lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside cool waters, he— Drummond jabbed Angus with a triumphant forefinger. They didn't invent any religion after all. It isn't important how they got it, the fact that they accepted it. That's what's important. Mackintosh glanced up at Drummond. They probably found this in the wreck of the ship they'd been in. It's easy to see they haven't used it in hundreds of generations. Instead, the gist of what's in it was passed down orally, and their basic concepts of man and supervisor were distorted all along the way, confused with the idea of God. Gently, he let the cover fall and a shining square of duraloid fell out. "'It's somebody's picture!' Drummond exclaimed. "'An ID card,' Angus said, holding it so the light wouldn't reflect off its transparent protective cover. It was a picture of a nondescript man, not as stout as Drummond, nor as lean as Mackintosh, with hair neither all black like the younger man's, nor nearly all white like Angus's. 
The print below the picture was indiscernible, except for the subject's last name. Jackson, Drummond whispered. Anger slowly replaced the card. A hundred years of false devotion, he said pensively. Just think. This is no time for that kind of gas, Drummond glanced at his watch. We got just two hours to cut off those converters. Desperately, he faced the robots. Hey, you clunkers! You robot assemblers! You got four hundred clunkers in that cave, all in pieces. Get in there and put them together! Angus shook his head disapprovingly. Somehow it didn't seem right, calling them clunkers. Jackson is my supervisor, intoned RA-204. Jackson is my supervisor, echoed the mass. Drummond glanced frantically at his watch, then looked helplessly at Angus. Angus shrugged. The younger man's face suddenly tensed with resolution. So they got to have a Jackson. All right, I'll give him one. He waved his fist at the horde. I'm your supervisor. I'm your Jackson. Now clear out of the way and... RA-76's hand darted out and seized Drummond's ankle, tugged him off the ledge. As he fell to the ground, a score of robots closed in over him, metal arms flailing down methodically. Angus yelled at them to stop, saw he was too late, and sank down, turning away sickly. Finally, after a long while, they backed off and faced Angus. "'We have passed the divine test, O Jackson!' 204 shouted up jubilantly. "'We have redeemed ourselves before our supervisor!' exclaimed 76. It took a long, horror-filled moment before Angus could speak. "'How do you know?' he managed to ask at last. "'If he had been Jackson,' exclaimed 204, "'we could not have destroyed him!' The robots fell prostrate again and returned to their devotional. But now the phrases were triumphant, where before they had been servile and uncertain. Angus stared numbly down at Drummond, then backed against the cliff. The litany below, exuberant now, grew mightily in volume, booming vibrantly against distant hills. "'There is but one supervisor,' intoned 204. "'But one Jackson,' answered the assembly. "'And now he dwelleth among his children,' 76 chanted. "'In their midst!' boomed the hundreds. Suddenly it all seemed horribly ludicrous, and Angus laughed. The litany stopped, and his laughter grew shriller, louder, edged with hysteria. The shimmering sea of metal, confounded, stared at him, and it was as though he could see fleshy furrows of confusion on the featureless faces. But how could a clunker show emotion? His laughter slowed and died, like the passing of a violent storm, and he felt weakened with a sickening sense of compassion. Robots— Human robots, standing awed before the unknown concepts while they groped for truth. Clunkers with a sense of right and wrong, and with an overwhelming love. It was absurd that he had been a elected father of twelve hundred children, whether flesh or metal, but it didn't feel at all absurd. "'Dost thou despair of us, O Jackson?' asked Seventy-Six hesitantly, staring up at him. 204 motioned toward the ship, the top of its hull shining beyond the nearby woods. "'Wouldst thou still return to thy vessel, supervisor?' Incredulous, Angus tensed. "'You mean I can go?' "'If that is thy wish, true Jackson, you may go,' said Seventy-Six submissively. As he watched unbelievingly, a corridor opened in their ranks, extending toward the woods and the ship beyond. He glanced anxiously at his watch. There was still more than an hour left. Wearily, he dropped from the ledge and trudged toward freedom, trying to look straight ahead. His eyes, nevertheless, wandered to the dejected figures who faced him with their heads bowed. Then he laughed again, realising the illogical nature of his solicitor's thoughts. Imagine, dejected clunkers! Still the metal faces seemed somehow different. Where, 
A moment earlier he had fancied expressions of jubilation. Now there was the sense of hopelessness on the steel plates. Shrugging off his uncertainty, he walked faster. After all, was it his fault they had stumbled upon a substitute for birth and death, and had become something more than clunkers? What was he supposed to do? Stay and play missionary? Bring them the truth, so that when a deactivation crew came along, they would be so advanced morally that no one would suggest their destruction? He stopped and scanned the ranks on either side. He'd do one thing for them, at least. He wouldn't report the wreck. Then it would be centuries, probably, before another ship wandered far enough away from the trade routes to intercept the distress signal. Relieved by his decision, he went ahead more at ease, and the litany started again, softly, appealing. Jackson is my supervisor. I shall not rust. Angus stiffened abruptly and stared at his watch, realising belatedly that it had stopped. But how long ago? How much time did he have left? Should he take the chance and make a dash for the converters? He reached the end of the robot corridor and started to sprint for the ship. But he halted and turned to glance back at the humble, patient horde. They were expectantly silent now as though they could sense his indecision. He backed away from them. Then the light of a hundred Arcturan days flared briefly, and a mighty mountain of sound and concussion collapsed on him. The trees buckled, and branches were hurled out against the cliff. It rained leaves and pieces of metal from the hull for a long while as Angus hugged the ground. When he finally looked up, Familiar bits of the ship were strewn around him. A spacesuit helmet here, a control dial there, a transmitter tube up ahead. He rose shakily, staring at a black book that lay near the helmet with its pages ruffled. He picked it up and straightened out the leaves. Then he motioned to the robots and they clustered around him. He would have to start from the beginning. He wet his lips. In the beginning, Angus read in a loud, convincing voice, God created heaven and earth, and the earth was void and empty, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, Let there be light. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Beside Still Waters by Robert Sheckley Originally published in Amazing Stories, October-November, 1953 Narrated by Tom Trissel Mark Rogers was a prospector and he went to the asteroid belt looking for radioactives and rare metals. He searched for years, never finding much, hopping from fragment to fragment. After a time, he settled on a slab of rock half a mile thick. Rogers had been born old, and he didn't age much past a point. His face was white with the pallor of space and his hands shook a little. He called his slab of rock Martha, after no girl he had ever known. He made a little strike, enough to equip Martha with an air pump and a shack, a few tons of dirt and some water tanks, and a robot. Then he settled back and watched the stars. The robot he bought was a standard model all-around worker, with built-in memory and a thirty-word vocabulary. Mark added to that, bit by bit. He was something of a tinkerer, and he enjoyed adapting his environment to himself. At first, all the robot could say was, Yes, sir, and no, sir. 
he could state simple problems. The air pump is labouring, sir. The corn is budding, sir. He could perform a satisfactory salutation. Good morning, sir. Mark changed that. He eliminated the sirs from the robot's vocabulary. Equality was a rule on Mark's hunk of rock. Then he dubbed the robot Charles, after a father he had never known. As the years passed, the air pump began to labour a little as it converted the oxygen in the planetoid's rock into a breathable atmosphere. The air seeped into space, and the pump worked a little harder, supplying more. The crops continued to grow on the tamed black dirt of the planetoid. Looking up, Mark could see the sheer blackness of the river of space, the floating points of the stars. Around him, under him, overhead, masses of rock drifted, and sometimes the starlight glinted from their black sides. Occasionally, Mark caught a glimpse of Mars or Jupiter. Once he thought he saw Earth. Mark began to tape new responses into Charles. He added simple responses to cue words. When he said, How does it look? Charles would answer, Oh, pretty good, I guess. At first the answers were what Mark had been answering himself in the long dialogue held over the years. But slowly he began to build a new personality into Charles. Mark had always been suspicious and scornful of women, but for some reason he didn't tape the same suspicion into Charles. Charles's outlook was quite different. What do you think of girls? Mark would ask, sitting on a packing case outside the shack, after the chores were done. Oh, I don't know. You have to find the right one. The robot would reply dutifully, repeating what had been put on its tape. I never saw a good one yet, Mark would say. Well, that's not fair. Perhaps you didn't look long enough. There's a girl in the world for every man. You're a romantic, Mark would say scornfully. The robot would pause, a built-in pause, and chuckle a carefully constructed chuckle. I dreamed of a girl named Martha once, Charles would say. Maybe if I would have looked, I would have found her. And then it would be bedtime. Or perhaps Mark would want more conversation. What do you think of girls? he would ask again, and the discussion would follow its same course. Charles grew old. His limbs lost their flexibility, and some of his wiring started to corrode. Mark would spend hours keeping the robot in repair. You're getting rusty, he would cackle. You're not so young yourself, Charles would reply. He had an answer for almost everything. Nothing involved, but an answer. It was always night on Martha, but Mark broke up his time into mornings, afternoons and evenings. Their life followed a simple routine. Breakfast from vegetables and Marx's canned store. Then the robot would work in the fields, and the plants grew used to his touch. Mark would repair the pump, check the water supply, and straighten up the immaculate shack. Lunch and the robot's chores were usually finished. The two would sit on the packing case and watch the stars. They would talk until supper, and sometimes late into the endless night. In time, Mark built more complicated conversations into Charles. He couldn't give the robot free choice, of course, but he managed a pretty close approximation of it. Slowly, Charles's personality emerged. 
but it was strikingly different from Marx's. Where Mark was querulous, Charles was calm. Mark was sardonic, Charles was naive. Mark was a cynic, Charles was an idealist. Mark was often sad, Charles was forever content. And in time, Mark forgot he had built the answers into Charles. He accepted the robot as a friend of about his own age, a friend of long years' standing. The thing I don't understand, Mark would say, is why a man like you wants to live here. I mean, it's all right for me, no one cares about me, and I never gave much of a damn about anyone. But why you? Here I have a whole world, Charles would reply where on earth I had to share with billions. I have the stars, bigger and brighter than on earth. I have all space around me, close like still waters. And I have you, Mark. Now don't go getting sentimental on me. I'm not. Friendship counts. Love was lost long ago, Mark. The love of a girl named Martha whom neither of us ever met, and that's a pity, but friendship remains, and the eternal night. You're a bloody poet, Mark would say, half admiring. A poor poet. Time passed unnoticed by the stars, and the air pump hissed and clanked and leaked. Mark was fixing it constantly, but the air of Martha became increasingly rare. Although Charles laboured in the fields, the crops, deprived of sufficient air, died. Mark was tired now, and barely able to crawl around, even without the grip of gravity. He stayed in his bunk most of the time. Charles fed him as best he could, moving on rusting, creeping limbs. What do you think of girls? I never saw a good one yet. Well, that's not fair. Mark was too tired to see the end coming, and Charles wasn't interested. But the end was on its way. The air pump threatened to give out momentarily. There hadn't been any food for days. But why you? gasping in the escaping air, strangling. Here I have a whole world, don't get sentimental, and the love of a girl named Martha. From his bunk, Mark saw the stars for the last time, big, bigger than ever, endlessly floating in the still waters of space. The stars, Mark said, yes, the sun shall shine as now, a bloody poet, a poor poet, and girls. I dreamed of a girl named Martha once, maybe if... What do you think of girls, and stars, and earth? And it was bedtime, this time forever. Charles stood beside the body of his friend. He felt for a pulse once, and allowed the withered hand to fall. He walked to a corner of the shack and turned off the tired air pump. The tape that Mark had prepared had a few cracked inches left to run. I hope he finds his Martha, the robot croaked, and then the tape broke. His rusted limbs would not bend, and he stood frozen, staring back at the naked stars. Then he bowed his head. The Lord is my shepherd, Charles said. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me. The End Subscribe, 
for your daily stories of futures past. A new story every single day.